prayer. I want to talk about three things as we continue in our series on prayer as part of restoration. And we are going to be answering some three important questions. And today we are gleaning a little bit from the life of Nehemiah, how Nehemiah prayed. Three things we want to address. How should we pray? Should we pray for our enemies? When do we pray? So number one, how should we pray? Before we even do that, we need to know the types of prayer. Well, there are people who come out with all kinds of types of prayers, but what kind of prayer are really there, outside there in God's economy? How many of them? And let me quickly highlight 12 types of prayer. Number one, prayer of agreement. Prayer of agreement is when multiple believers agree on earth with what heaven is saying. If two of you on earth agree about anything, you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. And today we have agreed as a church that God will come through for our dear brother and servant of the Lord here, Pastor Ben. Matthew 18, 19, 20 talks about that. Number one, prayer of agreement. Number two, prayer of confession. Prayer of confession. And when we talk about confession, we are talking about acknowledging our sins to God and celebrating the forgiveness we have received. If we claim we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. First John 1, 8, 9, there talks about that. Confession is you acknowledging your sin to God and celebrating the forgiveness you have received. Psalm 51, verse 2 to 3 talks about that, where David says, Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my sin is always before you or before me. That type of prayer is fellowship. That is spending time with God in an activity that is not necessarily sacred, but you are spending time with God, lingering in the presence of God until you really connect with this God. Fellowshipping with God is also prayer. Genesis 3.8 gives us the reference, Adam and Eve before God in the Garden of Eden. Number four is intercession. Prayer of intercession is God leading you to pray for the needs of a person, for the needs of a place, or for a cause. And the Bible talks of prophetess Anna in Luke chapter 2, verse 37. Here was a widow who was 84 years, and she never left the temple, but worshipped God day and night, fasting and praying. Today we have messed up the art of intercession. Intercessory guys or ladies and gentlemen whom they think God has called them into the ministry of intercession, they have become so demanding. They want the church to recognize them. They have got their own, their own, their own expectation. And if things doesn't pile up the way they want to, they will begin to sometimes even throw curses on the ministry. Don't you recognize that we are intercessors? There's a lot of arrogancy in the body of Christ. God hates it with passion. Are you an intercessor? Does God know you? And if at all God knows you then, take your place and don't be laying or waving any card of demand. Go to God in the privacy because God is leading you to do certain specific things. Go and do it. Do it and let God seize you and let God be the one to reward you. There are some intercessors who demand lunch and breakfast and even supper and transport money. Shame on you. Another aspect of prayer is listening. Sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening for him. And that is where many of us, we blow it. We don't want to sit still and listen. We are busy men, okay? Africans are men and women of action, isn't it? We can only see that things are moving when we are, when, when, when we see sweat coming, that's when we know that things are really happening for us and we bring the same mindset in the body of Christ in worshiping God until we sweat we have not connected with God. It is the Africanness in us, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Until we feel something then God is moving.
until tears are coming, until we are rolling like caterpillars and snakes. That is when the Spirit of God is really moving. Hey! That is when we feel God is moving. But is it really God? Is it really God? Or well, most of it, it is works of the flesh and demonic influences. <laughs> The spirit is moving. Is it really the spirit? Is it really the spirit? Come on, somebody help me preach here. Is it really the spirit? Oh, you've eaten mogo. Listening. Mary of Bethany is a key example. The psalmist says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Be still and know that I am God. Some of us need to learn to sit at the feet of Jesus. Just learn to sit at the feet of Jesus. Sometimes the pains are too much. You cannot even afford any drama. You just need to sit there and be still and let this God meet you in your brokenness, in your pain. Let this God meet you and this God yearns to meet us when we quiet our hearts, when we remain still and recognize that he is the one. After all, we are not a mistake. He is the one who knows everything about us. Be still and know that he is God. God. Number six is petition. I will go into that because it's part of my sermon. Let me go to number seven. Prayer of praise, declaring the truth about who God is, what he has done or what he has promised to do. Psalm 150 verse six says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. We talked about that, that prayer involves praise. In our message last Sunday. Number eight, praying the Bible. Praying the words of the Bible as your prayer. How many of us pray according to scripture? Very few of us. Many of us, our prayer is just based on our opinions. Words we have conjured. But in those words, there would not even be a single statement of God's precious word. In that statement, we are making as prayer. Not a single quote from scripture. Not even John 3.16, for God so loved the world. But your opinions and your pain, not a single scripture in the world. And some of us will sweat and we, we are... <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm a student in prayer and I'm learning a lot. I don't have it together when it comes to prayer. But prayer where you just hear your own vocabulary. How good your English is. Without a single scriptural reference in the prayer. Mm -mm. No wonder things doesn't shift for many of us. Today we have come out with our own philosophy, with our own dynamics of what prayer is all about. Pray the Bible. Pray the words of the Bible as your prayer. Joshua 1a talks about that. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written, written in it. Then you will prosper. Pray God's word. And I think that is the best way you and I can begin prayer 101. Praying according to what God says in his word. Number nine. Some of you may believe in this, some of you don't, but let me say it all together. I gleaned. There is also what they call prayer in tongues. Praying in a personal spiritual language that edifies you and your relationship with God. Key Bible character is Paul who says, I speak more than any one of you in tongues. First Corinthians 14, 14 is, an, is a reference to that. There is that, but there are people who don't believe in that. It depends what kind of school of theology you come from. That there is gone gone. It's not relevant for us now. That's why you need to become a student of God's word and also student of theology. You need to know what is happening around. There are those who capitalize on this so much that your prayer is not prayer until you have spoken in tongues. 
And that's why we need to become students of God's word. Then there is also those who believe in what they call prophetic prayer, receiving a message from God for someone else. Jeremiah 1 verse 7 talks about that. The thing that, can, that, that God can use somebody to, to see in the spirit and he can speak it over you. And it happens. And then there is prayer of thanksgiving. That is offering thanks to God. First Thessalonians 5.18 talks about that. And then the final one, number 12, is prayer of warfare. Warfare prayer. That is confronting the kingdom of Satan with the weapons of God's kingdom. Ephesians 6.12 talks about that. So those are a few of the types of prayer we find in scripture. Now, I want us to talk briefly about petition. And that is gleaning from the example of Nehemiah from chapter 1 from verse 5 to 11. When I talk about petition, petition is an appeal, a request, a plea, invocation. You and I can petition God because of God's word. We can petition God because of God's word. In petition, when we talk about prayer of petition, it is you figuring out the what of your reason behind the prayer. Prayer is not just anything you do. There must be a reason for why you are praying. If you don't have any reason for praying, just keep quiet and let God do his work. So when it comes to petition, you figure out the what of your reason behind the prayer. And so when it comes to petition, be specific. Stand on God's word. Have faith in God and speak life. Speak positivity. Resting on the promises of God. Don't come to God in prayer and begin to say, ha, will it ever happen? <laughs> this that God is leading me to pray. Will it ever happen? Will it ever happen? Will it ever happen? Some of us, we go to the point of saying, will God really listen? That for us, we are always known for pain. For us, nothing good ever happens. Nothing good ever happens to us. Okay, I will try. But will God, will God really hear me? Will God really turn his face towards me? Back and forth, we juggle those negative conversations. Guess what? You are actually short circuiting every good intention the Spirit of God is setting in motion on your behalf. Prayer is very tricky. That's why we need to come on God's term as we pray. Don't shoot yourself in the foot by your negativity. If you know that God is powerful and you really recognize his power, then entrust things into his hand. Ladies and gentlemen, words are so powerful. Life and death is in the tongue. Nehemiah hid it on, in his prayer and see what he says. What is his reason for prayer? Prayer to Nehemiah took this turn. Things are bad at home. The people who have returned back from exile are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 3 talks about that. Come on, let's turn to Jeremiah. Some of you may be thinking that this guy is just creating stuff from his head. Nehemiah chapter 1. Verse 3. Verse 3. They say to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burnt with fire. And then in verse 4, when I heard this thing, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said in verse 5, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandment. In other words, Jeremiah here is reflecting on the word of God based on the report that has been brought to him all the way from Jerusalem. His brother, Ananias, came to him as he was in Susa and reported to him all that was at home. Two Sundays ago, I talked about what does it come to you every time you hear the word home. And for us, the word home depicts all kinds of horrible things that has ever happened to us. And we don't even want to hear anything about home. And so the news of what was happening home in Jerusalem was brought to the attention of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was well placed in the government then. And so when he heard 
that became the purpose of his prayer. That became the prime reason for Nehemiah's prayer. That became part and parcel of his petition to God. And the Bible says in verse 4 that when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. And for some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. The reason behind Nehemiah's prayer is the mess in Jerusalem, broken walls, broken people, things out of order in Jerusalem, suffering, chaos. And he takes it upon himself to carry the burden. And we said last week that prayer involves taking responsibility. Here we see Nehemiah taking responsibility for the problem going back at home and see what it says in verse 6 I confess the sins we Israelites including myself my father's house have committed against you in other words God our sin have caused us this problem on us the mass of, of our people are on our back and why is it because of sin and Nehemiah says, but here it is, Lord. In verse 11, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant who delight in revering your name. You study the book of Nehemiah and you, you see the lines of the statement that is coming from his hand as it is written down here. You see a man who has got total honor for who God is. reason for the prayer is this, according to Hanmiah, sin has caused all this. God, we are sorry. And so God, we ask that give us another chance. Restore us. You read from verse 5 to 11, you see his petition. In petition, you figure the what of your reason behind the prayer. And here it is because of sin that is standing before God and asking God to forgive, asking God to restore. And so this morning, I want us to know this. Why do we pray? Why are you praying? For what? What is it? If you can touch it, what is it exactly that you want God to do that is moving you into prayer? Maybe sometime it is good for you and I to write down our prayers. Nehemiah's, we see here documenting evident reason why he came to God in prayer. Why he petitioned God. Don't say it is not spiritual to write prayer concerns down on a piece of paper. Buy a big notebook. Pour your heart there. Document it down in black and white. You never know, God will bring you back to some of those things. And it becomes an amazing stepping stone to something special that God will want to see come out of your life. Jot down your prayer. Keep it in the journal. It's amazing as I was preparing for this, I came across some prayer that I made in 2003. 2003. And it dawned on me, my goodness. It's 2021. Document your prayer. Write it down. And this morning I want to say that some things must change about our prayer lives. Can we begin to pray from a very informed position? Most prayers are based on competition. Some of us, we pray because we want the sister in the other corner. We are eyeing to see how spiritual we are. It happens all the time in fellowship. Sometimes I sit in fellowship and I just marvel as I watch people. Don't just go and pray far like that. Have a reason for your prayer. That when you're coming in this auditorium to connect with God in prayer, have a reason. If you don't have any reason, don't come into this place for prayer. We're not interested in your noise. We're not interested in your theatrical drama. No. No. Have a reason that brings you before God. And if you don't have any reason, you stay somewhere there and do your kabozi. But if you're coming into God's presence and you want to connect with him, come with a reason. Come with a reason. And then become an impetus in your own heart to be able to move and connect with this God. When you have a reason, when you have a purpose, then you are going to be scoring in God's economy. Prepare yourself. 
Assess carefully your situation. Analyze it. Know what is the pressure point in your situation. What exactly needs God's attention. And then be specific. Stand on his word. Have faith in God. And then speak life. Speak life. The second thing I would want us to confront this morning in our message is what about praying for your enemies? Who is an enemy? Is it right for you who has been hurt badly to pray for somebody who has hurt you? Listen, not everything went smoothly with Nehemiah, even when God answered his prayers. Yes, God opened door for him. He went back to Jerusalem. God took him back to Jerusalem. And he started the building of the walls. And this is it. Just because God grants you success in one area does not guarantee continual success. Every season in life requires equal focus on God as the first one that brought you that success. Prayer must be continuous. And that is a huge challenge with walking with God. You don't walk with God for a day. It is a process. It's a day to day, day to day. How many of you here have stopped eating? How many of you have stopped eating? Anybody? Anybody? The moment you stop eating, what happens? Do you eat food every day? Has anybody here stopped eating? That's the same with prayer. Prayer is the life breath of the soul. It is an on and on and on and on relationship with God. Wait on the Lord. In all things, give thanks. Pray always or pray continually. Make your request known to God. It does not say do it on a Sunday and wait till the next Sunday comes. No. There is nothing like continual success. You will get challenges and sometimes fierce opposition in life. And just because the king gave a huge yes to Nehemiah to come and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and even gave him free access to state resources, that did not shield Nehemiah from opposition. And so what do you do when people oppose you in your face? When people belittle you and cut you into pieces verbally, what do you do? What do you do when they say nasty stuff behind your backs and even withhold love, honor, and respect and literally sabotage anything you may possibly be doing for the good of all? What do you do? God tells us to pray for our enemies. Even if the prayer gets stuck in your throat, force it out, force yourself, and complete the prayer sentence. Even if you find it so difficult to pray for that person who has abused you, who has used you, who has hurt you, you find it very difficult for the words to come out of your mouth. Go ahead, do it, because God commands us to pray for our enemies. Force yourself and complete the sentence. Let's read Nehemiah chapter 4 from verse 1 to 5. Nehemiah chapter 4 from verse 1 to 5. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stone back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? The Bible says Tobiah the Ammonite who was at his side said, what they are building, even a fox climbing up on it would break down their wall of stones. And Nehemiah says in verse 4, hear us our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. In verse 4 and 5, Nehemiah says, hear us our God, for we are despised. Genuine prayers from our heart 
regarding our enemies, ladies and gentlemen, and what they may possibly be doing against us, we need to resign it to God. And when we resign it to God, God gives the opportunity to deal with our enemies in his own way. And it will spare you the unnecessary pressure of dealing with them in your own strength because dealing with them in your own strength will short circuit exactly what God is in the process of doing in your life. And so when it comes to praying for our enemies, hand them over to God. And do all you can to leave them in the hands of God. And by the way, don't even think of advising God what to do with them. Hey, surrender them to God and let God be the one to take care of them. I know it is painful. I know it hurts. I know you want to be even and you want God to pay them in their currency that they have given to you and everything within you scream for revenge. Revenge, if you are walking with Jesus, belongs to God. Revenge belongs to God. Is there anybody here who has been hurt so badly by somebody else? Maybe your workmate. Maybe even somebody within this fellowship and they have hurt you so bad. They have said very nasty things against you and you can't even look them into the eye. Pray for them. Mm, God, what are you saying? Pray for them. To pray for that dude who has hurt me so much, yes, pray for that dude. But that dude, I cannot even stand it. And when he comes in front of the church like this, I want to go through garden courts. Pray for that person. Some of us have been abused terribly by our loved ones, even by our parents. Pray for those who have used you, abused you, and left you on the garbage heap. Pray for them. That is painful. God, I cannot even get myself to think about that. God says, pray for your enemies. Pray for your enemies. Some of these things we need to go and process it back home. Is this really true? God, do I have the guts to pray for somebody who has hurt me badly? Do I have the guts? In your own strength, you cannot. And you will not. But we talked about prayer of positioning ourselves and being still before the Lord. Now, those are things that will cry you to be still before the Lord. And if it means crying and weeping in that corner before the Lord alone, go do it. And after you have shed the tears, eventually God will begin to encourage. God will begin to give you a clear sense of direction that this is the way you need to go. But God, I've been hurt so badly. Yes, God knows and he sees the pain you're going through. Jesus himself says this, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your father in heaven. What about our father in heaven? He causes his son to sign, to rise on the evil and the good. And the father in heaven sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Matthew 5, 43 to 45 talks about that. In God's economy, Everybody matters, even those who don't have any regard for God. God cares for them. God cares for that person who has hurt you. And that's why he says, pray for them. Sanballat and Tobiah were two naughty, idiotic dudes who gave real hard time for Nehemiah. They were public enemy number one, literally thorn in the flesh to Nehemiah. And so left and right, they oppose every progress the remnant Jews were making in rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Their words alone, their vocabulary alone would discourage any well-meaning, spirit-filled, tongue-speaking dude. Their words were nasty. And ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing like verbal, I call it verbal artillery, that messes emotions of people. Words that come from some of our mouths are really toxic. And you say, can that really come from the mouth of so and so? Let us be careful with what we allow come out of our mouth. Words can build, words can encourage, words can also split any relationship into pieces. Words. 
What is causing marriages to fail? Words. Words. What causes war? Words. 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 They used to say, the late President Idi Amin said that President Nyerere was a woman. That he will beat Nyerere like a woman. And what happened to Amin? Words. Words. Words is what causes war. Words. Words is what causes split in relationship. Families don't see eye to eye because of what? Because of words. Words. Where there is pain, where there is hurt, where there is disagreement, all this, you will trace it back to words. And words can also set the environment. Words of love and affirmation, words of encouragement. I believe in you. You can make it. You can go, 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 God can see you through. Those words can create somebody to catapult literally into life. Words create life. And that is why God created the earth by the power of spoken word that came out of his mouth. He spoke and there it came to pass. Words. How are you using your words? How are you using your words? And here Sanballat says, hey, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore the wall? Will they offer sacrifice? Will they finish it in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life? Chapter 4, verse 2. Then his partner in mockery named Tobias, who was by his side, had this to say, hey, what they're even building, even a fox, when he climbs on it, he would break down their walls of stone. And then you hear that and you are working hard and you hear that kind of statement, you hear that kind of words being uttered around you. Are you going to have the morale to really continue working? Ladies and gentlemen, what stings, what derails, what frustrates, what kills. There is so much power in the tongue. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful how you use your tongue. Number three, when do you pray? First Thessalonians talks about always be joyful from verse 16 to 18. Always keep on praying and always be thankful. Why? For this is the will of God for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Our joy is Prayers and thankfulness to God should not fluctuate with our circumstances or feelings. When you and I take conscious decision to do what God says we, do, we should do, we are going to start seeing people in a new perspective. When you and I do God's will, we will find it easier to be joyful and thankful. So when do you pray? We cannot spend all our time on our knees. But I want us to know that it's very possible to have a prayerful attitude all the time. And this attitude is built on you and I acknowledging our dependence on God, realizing his presence within us and our determination to obey him fully. Then it becomes naturally for you and I to pray frequently. Spontaneous prayers will just burst forth. You will just burst forth in it. And all these are things that you can learn. These are things that we can learn. But I want us to get this. A prayerful attitude is not a substitute for regular times of prayer. A prayerful attitude should be an outgrowth of those times that you have created intentionally to be with God. I think top priority in the life of a believer is you creating time to connect with God through his word and through prayer. Creating time. And being very intentional about it. We talked about intentionality here in our Wednesday service. Create specific time that you can really meet God on an individual basis. Do not pray because so and so is praying. Do not pretend that you are praying when you are actually goofing around. And many of us, we do that. Prayer is a learned habit. There is no one who is expert in prayer. All of us have different experiences when it comes to prayer. Some of us are short sentence prayer people. 
And some of us are long-winded, full blast vocabulary from King James scripture quotation to NIV in our prayers. But listen to this. Never come to that place of arrogance and pride that God hears you faster than the guy who prays two sentences prayer only. And I've also come to realize that there is so much pride when it comes to prayer. So much arrogance and pride in the hearts and in the lives of some people. God sees each one of us. And when we come into a setting like this, ladies and gentlemen, let your words be few. When do you pray? Make sure there's no traffic jam in your prayers. No traffic jam in your prayers. Delete traffic jam in your prayers. And can I say the traffic jam in prayer is more than the traffic jam in one day at times. Listen to this. The reason why most of us have real issue with prayer is because of the traffic jam of sin. I'm being very down to earth to you this morning. The traffic jam of sin. Sin has traffic jam most of us. Traffic jam of lies, deceit, laziness, compromise, gossip, sex, small thinking where we take God as our bodies, no reverence at all for him and we come to him because we are demanding him. God, if you don't show up at this point in time, I am done with you. I'm going to call it a quit. Those kind of arrogance, honestly. Keep it under the papyrus. Listen to me. If I regard sin in my heart, in my life, my prayers will hit dead ceiling. And when we pray and we know there is no sin in our life, there is going to be a huge disconnect in our prayer. And most of us, we don't connect well with God because we are living in sin. We are walking in sin. Whoever approaches a king, when he is dirty or stinking, you cannot afford to go to state house and Tebe and you are in rags. You are not even going to touch the fence of state house. And by the way, you go to state house on appointment. No king will at tolerate, will, will entertain, will even allow into his presence somebody who is dirty. You cannot come into the presence of a king. Dirty, stinking, disrespectful, none. The security will not even allow you to touch the gate to the state house. And ladies and gentlemen, that's what sin does to any one of us. Sin quickly disqualifies us in our fellowship with God. And so what do we do with sin? We need to get rid of sin. We need to clean ourselves. And how do we clean ourselves? By confessing our sin, by repenting off of our sins. We take responsibility for our sin. We turn around and we ask God to forgive us. If you and I claim we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is just and able to forgive and cleanse us from all our sin. And so we recognize that we have sinned against this God. So what do we do? We confess our sin and then deliberately we take action against that sin that we know blocks our fellowship with this God. Relationship is secure but our fellowship is always interrupted by our sin here and there and that's why we need to not get tired of confessing our sin. We sin by what we see. We sin in our mind. We sin through our action. All the time when God's spirit brings that to your attention, you need to confess it. Confess it to God. Confess your sin. Take responsibility for your sin. And so when sin is dealt with, the traffic jam is cleared. And then we get a clear passage in our prayers to God. Wage war on sin if you want to enjoy your prayer moments with God. The psalmist says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Psalm 66 verse 18. And what does it mean to regard iniquity in one's heart? It means to keep sin in one's heart. You and I being unwilling to part with it. You know something is a sin, yet you continue to cherish it. Iniquity is someone doing some things on purpose. Iniquity is deviation from what is right. Iniquity means someone lacks moral or spiritual backbone or principles. And for those of us who know Jesus and claims to be walking with him, and you go ahead and you commit sin, 
sin, you commit sin with a friend, you commit sin against somebody, there is iniquity. If you who is walking with Jesus and you go ahead and you're living a sexual lifestyle and you know you're not married but you're living a sexual active lifestyle, you are doing a huge disservice to Jesus and top on our sin list, especially men and women, young and old. Sex literally top the list. You're not married and you know what God says about that sin and you go ahead and you do it. That is cherishing iniquity. And when I talk about cherishing iniquity, that is anything that lives inside of you and I that we know is there and yet we choose to keep it hidden. It is those sins we choose to keep and excuse ourselves from it from time to time. Some of you are going to say, well, for me, I am wired that way. For me, I cannot control myself. And I guess God understands. And after all, we are in the great dispensation. Hey, hey, listen to Pastor Micah. Iniquity is the kind of sin that hinders our prayer and our relationship with this God. Let me say, top on this is the sexual sin that has pervaded homes and fellowship and churches. And God hates it with passion. That young guys who are living socially and active sexual life and they come and they minister before a holy God and you know that it's your lifestyle. God hates you with a passion. Listen, after all, what has he done? I am the most anointed. One of these days, he will drag you right from this pulpit and we'll see you sluggering there. You cannot afford to keep playing games with God. I don't care how anointed you are. You cannot keep playing games with God. And top on the list that is messing the body of Christ is sex. Sexual sin has messed God's work. God's work that is so holy, we have belittled it because of our passion. And God hates it. Some of you wonder why your prayers are not being answered. When sin is repeated against the knowledge of God, it becomes what the Bible calls transgression. And if it goes on and long enough, it becomes iniquity, which actually perverts the flesh. Psalm 32 verse 5 says, Then I acknowledge my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. Today, if you hear this dude preaching to you and you know that you're toying around with sin in your life, things that you know you need to correct, things that you know you have been covering, things that you know Pastor Micah does not even know about, but you know it and you have been, you have been, you have been, you have been, you have been navigating with those things in your life and you know you should confront it, you know you should get rid of it and you have been keeping it on, hiding it there. I hope it is not the eggs of a snake. One day, it is going to produce. And if it is a cobra, it will lift its head and... Whoop. Isaiah 59 verse 2 talks about, Your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. See this, God needs to have mercy on all of us. We can't allow sin to block our fellowship with God. We can't afford sin to hinder our blessing. Come on, when it comes to sin, ladies and gentlemen, can I plead with you as your pastor, keep short account, keep short account when it comes to sin. See what the Bible says in Hebrews 10 verse 26. I hope you're hearing what I'm saying this morning. Bible says here, for if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of God's judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anybody who is continuously in perpetual sin, you are setting yourself up to be the arch enemy of God. And for my prayers, for your prayers to really become effective, we must literally run away from sin. And so please know, as you're coming to God in prayer, that there is no known sin in your life that blocks your prayer with God. And I think it is a sin for a young man or a young lady to think he knows or she knows better and cannot serve under anyone. 
Those who think, hey, since God has called them and they cannot always start, and they can always start their own ministry and do their own things, that is spiritual arrogance. In God's economy, there is order, absolute discipline. God has not changed. His principle must be followed, and he's not about to change it because of any man. He's not going to change his rules. Understanding God's perspective of ministry is so important, and that is why we are talking about what prayer is and what it is not. For any man to walk acceptably before God or with God, he must embrace God's protocol. Finally, each one of us must find out where we stand in our purposes of God. What is it that God has graciously assigned to you? Spend time figuring it out. Life is too short to be wasted. When it comes to prayer, pray about everything. Pray for your life. Pray for every decision you need to make. Pray for your relationship. Those of you are in relationship, pray for the money that you need to use. Pray even for how you need to use it. It is coming to that point now that prayer must affect every area of our life. Pray, ask God, is this the dude I should really be going out with? Ask God, ask God, ask God. Don't let your feelings, don't let your eyes set you onto somebody that you know is not God's will. That's why it is very important for you, those who want to pursue relationship. Ask God, is that the right person that I need to even say yes to? Ask God, ask God. Those of you who are looking for employment, ask God to guide you. Ask God to lead you. Do I apply here or do I apply there. Ask God, ask God, pray and ask God. Pray to God for the cause you would want to take. God, is this in your will? Where will this lead me? Bring it back home here. Let me bring it back home here. Pastor Micah has been praying and I'm praying about everything in this place. God is teaching me to pray about everything in UCF. I've done ministry for so many years based on what I see, based on what I feel. And I'm saying, God, in this dispensation, I want to hear you. And I want you to let me know exactly what step I need to take, what step I need to take, what I need to do. I am praying and I'm praying and I'm saying, you know what? I'm praying for the kind of men and women, people that God should bring and raise in this church. And listen to me, I'm not interested in everybody. No, I'm not God. I don't have the capacity to love like God. I am Pastor Micah, flesh and blood. I get tired and sometimes I don't even want to set foot in this environment because I'm tired. But God loves everybody. Me, my love capacity is to this degree. You had me once, I may keep quiet. The second time, I don't even want to see you. That is flesh and blood. And so I don't have the capacity to love everybody. But God helps me to love as many as I can. And so this is what I'm saying. I'm not interested in everybody, but God sent, oh God should raise men and women in what he wants done here. If you are going to be part of what God is going to do here in UCF, know you are prayed a person. And if God has brought you here, you will hear God. And when you hear God, you obey God and do what God needs done in this environment. I'm praying for leaders that God should raise his type, not Pastor Micah's kind, his type of leaders, not Pastor Micah's preferences. I'm praying about that. I'm praying that every position of ministry in UCF, God will raise his choice of men and women, his kind, his type, and if you are of God, you will know it, and we will also see it and confirm it. But I'm not going to be going around recruiting people, no. I've done enough recruitment in these years. We have been serving God here. This time, no recruitment. Listen for me here. No recruitment. If God is raising somebody, God will confirm it and God will bring them and they'll say, Pastor Micah, I am here. Count on me. We are also saying we don't want to raise people who would want to get a paycheck every end of month. They will come by themselves and they'll sustain themselves. And along the way, as God provides, then they can be blessed. But you come here on the footing that God has brought you here. God is asking me to serve, not that Am I speaking to somebody this morning? And so if you are of God, you will know it. And we will see it. And we will confirm it. There is a line we are taking. Everything on the altar of prayer. Started on prayer. Sustained by prayer. Completed in prayer. That is UCF in this new dispensation. You may be here and you're struggling with prayer. 
I hope you have heard what I've shared with you today. And I want us to stand up for the next two or three minutes. If you're there and God is speaking to you, I just want you to lift your hands to the Lord and just ask the Lord to work in your hearts. If there is sin in your heart, in your life that you know has been hindering your relationship, your fellowship with God, I just want you to confess the sins to Jesus. You don't have to come in front of us here and share it, no. Between you and Jesus. Can we just rise up to our feet? And let us just stand before this God and ask him to search our hearts. Instrumentalists, if you can just come and play some songs, whatever the Lord leads you, we are going to take some time to just linger before the Lord for the next five minutes, and then we'll close the service, and then announcement will come. I just want us for the next two, three minutes to just do that. Just lift your hands to the Lord. Search me, O God. Let that be your prayer. Search me, O God. If there are any wicked ways in me, lead me into that path. God, would you do your work in us? Would you do your work in us, Lord? Would you do your work in us? God, you know me. You know who Pastor Micah is. You know my struggle. You know my pain. You know my challenge. You know even how impatient sometimes I am. You know it. You know how oftentimes I rush into things. You know it. You know it. God, you know it. You know everything about me. And we are children this morning or this afternoon stand before you. And they need you. They need a touch from you. So God, would you do your work? Would you do your work? Would you do your work? Would you do your work in the lives of your children? Would you set somebody free? There is somebody who is carrying so much weight, pain. Some are carrying pain and weight of sin. Some are carrying unforgiveness that they have carried on for years. There are people who have hurt them badly and yet you're saying here yeah, we should forgive our enemies and pray for our enemies. But somebody who is fighting, it's so difficult to really do that. And you see that lady, you see that man, you see that, you see them, you see them. And they're struggling, they're struggling to let go. May you by your spirit, oh God, do your work, do your work. Come through for that person. You know them, you know them. Come through for that person who is fighting, it's so difficult to let go. Me to pray for my enemy, that guy has hurt me so badly and me to open my mouth to you, God, and say, I forgive, and, 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 and he praying blessing over that person who has hurt you so badly, that is beyond, beyond, beyond emotion. God, I cannot do that. But God is saying to you, let go, let go that person and begin to bless that person and watch and see what God will do on your behalf. God, we come to you. We come to you this morning. Some of us cannot even go for a single minute not thinking about the pain in our life how we have been let down, how we have been used, how we have been abused. Every time those occurrences keep coming left and right, and there are times that we are literally paralyzed by the pain in life. And God, you see your children here, and I pray that you'll come through for that person who has carried that weight for so long. Set that child free today in the name of your son, Jesus. Do your work, oh God. Do your work, oh God. Do your work, oh God. Do your work in the hearts of your children. We stand in awe of you. You are a loving father. And you care for us. We don't have the capacity to carry those pain, those problems, those challenges, those bitterness. We don't have the capacity. It is killing some of us. We let go. We drop them today at the foot of your son Jesus. We drop them today at the foot of your son Jesus. Would you, oh God, take charge? So we thank you. And we love you and we honor you. God, would you bless your children? Bless them, oh God. And come through for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.